Hello everyone, welcome to ISAT Senior Symposium 2018. Today we have Alexander Hansen, uh, Wesley, and Eric as well. They're going to be talking to you about their project today. Enjoy. Good morning, and thank you all for coming. My name is Alex Hansen. I'm Tyler Hartman. Eric Vasquez. And today we will be presenting our senior capstone presentation on energy monitoring and control using IoT technology at Punta Leona Hotel e Club. Before we begin, we'd like to give a shout out and a thanks to our two partners and sponsors from traveling all the way from Costa Rica, Don Jose and Don Rainier. So gracias. Okay. At this point, I'd like to go ahead and give Eric the floor for the presentation overview. All right, so for the overview, uh, we're gonna talk about the problem, what we're tackling here, as well as the background of the hotel resort and why we're tackling this problem. Our solution to the problem, uh, the project goal, what we aim to do and accomplish, our project timeline, this includes our pre-deployment, which includes our research and development, as well as our implementation down in Costa Rica. Uh, next, we have our data analysis, as well as future improvements. And on the map here, you can see uh, Harrisonburg and, and the location where Costa Rica is. And on the close-up image of Costa Rica, you can see Punta Leona, which stands for the head of the lion. So next, we have a video of the hotel, just giving you the scenery of the nice rainforest uh, resort. <laughs> to do a capstone, right? <laughs> Alright, so for the problem, how do we reduce fossil fuel consumption when it's such an essential part of modern economies today? So our project mission goal, our mission statement, is to reduce dependence on fossil fuels globally through the power of the Internet of Things. So next we'll talk about the Internet of Things. The Internet of Things is basically Industry 4.0. Uh, so we're going to talk about Industry 1.0, which is basically the introduction of high energy consuming uh, materials, uh, which brings in coal, petroleum. Industry 2.0, which brings in the assembly line, and we see mass production <coughs> such as cars and other commercial goods. Industry 3.0 brings in automation, where robots are now building your, uh, building your commercial needs. And Industry 4.0, where the internet, you can control your machines and other devices and other product processes of the production line. Through, in, uh, through industry control systems that build your products. We believe it is unrealistic to transition large economies to become less dependent on fossil fuels without technological breakthroughs. The switch, or the Sensory Wireless Intelligent Technology Control Hub, grants the user the ability to monitor and control any device using their smartphone through the internet. Our project goal included four main tasks. First, the complete development and implementation of controlling and monitoring devices for use on AC and overhead lighting units non-invasively. Second, the development and deployment of an iOS application on multiple devices with separate authentication groups. Third, energy consumption data submitted in an hourly form to our database for, from the air conditioning units. And number four, database and API integration using Amazon Web Services, specifically the relational database service and the, El the Elastic Cloud Computing Service. This figure shows a map of the facilities at Punta Leona, where specifically we did most of our installation in the reception office area and the Sala Columbus conference area. Our project we divided into three separate components. We have the hardware component, the database component, and the software component. To make it easier, each one of our teammates took a specific component and became the expert in that field. The hardware component was led by Tyler, the database component was led by Eric, and the software component was led by myself. We will now took a, take a look at the pre-deployment timeline, which took over seven months, uh, starting in January 2017. For the initial two and a half months, we did research and development in Dr. El Tawab's 306 class. Uh, at that point, once we had developed three separate products, the hardware, database, and the software, we then took about three weeks to do inner 
component uh, integration. Once we had a complete system, we then went into error testing phase one, which we wanted to pretty much debug our prototype for when we met with our Punta Leona sponsors. At that point, we met with Don Jose and Don Rainier, and we came up with a two-day meeting with, where we went over specifics, such as how many units they wanted, where they wanted to install, uh, what kind of components they wanted controlled. Once we understood the needs and the wants of our partner, we went ahead and started our enhancements and improvements. We started with our hardware because we knew it would take time to build our hardware, so we wanted to finalize that first. Once we had finalized the hardware design, we went ahead and began construction of our 18 units. After we finished construction of our 18 units, we then moved into our final error testing phase, and then on July 27, 2017, we deployed and began our journey to Costa Rica. The preliminary hardware configuration consists of a few main components. First, we have the Raspberry Pi Zero, which is a small pocket-sized computer. Second, we have a relay, which is an electronic switch. Third, we have a CT or current transformer clamp, which is an analog sensor, <laughs> which is an analog sensor used to measure current. And finally, we have an analog digital converter used to turn that analog signal into a digital signal the Raspberry Pi can understand. Many of these components were then later consolidated into what we call the wireless node, seen here in the image to the right. The wireless node consists of the Raspberry Pi Zero wireless, and atop of the Raspberry Pi, we see the solderable prototype board. On the prototype board, we have an analog digital converter and a current transformer input and a relay input. The final list of components utilized to monitor and control devices included the wireless node, the current transformer clamp, and a solid state relay. The data flow for the hardware configuration can be seen here in this image, uh, where when a user attempts to turn on or off a unit from the hardware perspective, the first step is a status update from our database to the Raspberry Pi. This can be seen here in this script, where we have an established WebSocket which from, from our EC2 instance, which will transfer our data to the Raspberry Pi, seen in the lower half of the script. Once the data is on the Raspberry Pi, it will be filtered, and then we will have our, our final status. Once the status is on the Raspberry Pi, from that point, the second step is to switch the relay, which can be seen here in this segment. If the status received on the Raspberry Pi is on, a high signal will be sent to the relay, therefore turning the AC unit on. If the status received on the Raspberry Pi is off, a low signal will be sent to the relay, therefore turning the AC unit off. Energy monitoring is done with a CT clamp connected from the Raspberry Pi on the AC unit, and the readings are done using this script here. Multiple calibrated current readings are taken over the course of an hour, and then averaged for our final current. Then we finally take a power reading, then we can calculate our power reading, and finally our energy consumption in kilowatt hours. The energy consumption is then saved to a local file for later use. When we are ready to send that energy consumption to our database, we use a script here to open the file in this first segment, and then filter it out with the, for the data we need, and finally submit it into the database using an insert statement. The last step in the process is a checkback procedure, which will ensure that when we attempt to switch a unit on or off, it is successfully completed, which is done using this script here. An S will be submitted into the database here if the unit was successfully switched. If the unit was unsuccessfully switched, an F will be sent into the database. Hi, next, I'm going to talk about the ERD diagram, which is our database component. The ERD stands for Entity Relationship Diagram. Uh, basically what it is is a relationship of tables, uh, which each consists of various data points. Each table varies in size, and just, to follow, just so we follow along is one customer has many rooms, a room has many components, and these components uh, submit data through the Raspberry Pi onto our energy consumption table. Uh, this is where we've done most of our, the bulk of our data analysis. Uh, and the customer section is where basically the login authentication comes into play. So we're gonna look into a component just to basically understand what these tables look like. It's fairly simple. Uh, we have component ID, which is its primary key. Uh, primary key is a unique identifier that has to be unique for each data point. Uh, room ID, which is this foreign key, it's how it relates between our, its other tables. A component name, just so we can identify it for us, for our own um, understanding. Uh, component statuses, so whether we want to turn it on or off, this is where the app actually comes into the database and turns it on or off. As well as a couple other things, such as checkbacks, uh, which we'll talk about later, which does uh, certain things to check if the Wi-Fi is working the, or if the power is on or off. When a user attempts to turn on or off 
a status, I mean a component using their iOS device, the first pack, a number of packets are sent to and from the iOS device. The first packet attempts to send a status to the MySQL database. Unfortunately, because iOS applications are coded in Swift and MySQL uses the MySQL language, these are incompatible. To fix this, we use a privatized API or an application programmable interface. This is a collection of scripts, in our case, PHP files, which are hosted on a server. In our case, an Amazon EC2 instance. Once the Amazon EC2 instance receives our insert status, it then is sent to the MySQL database where it is put into the correct component column. Within seconds of that first packet being sent from the iOS device, a second packet is sent to start a PHP file which has two primary functions on the API. The first function is it queries and returns the status that we had just inserted. Once it has the status in the PHP script, it then runs the second function, which is creating a WebSocket, and then it pushes the status to the Raspberry Pi Zero, which the hardware data flow, which Tyler already talked about. But then once it attempts to turn on or off, regardless of its success, it then pushes a check back directly to the database. Now, because the Raspberry Pi Zero is coded in Python programming, and not in Swift, it is compatible with the MySQL language, so we can go directly bypassing the API. Once the checkback is inserted, a third and final script is ran from the, Mys from the iOS application uh, that queries, once again, to the API, and then checks, gets the checkback, and then returns it to the iOS device, in which case the iOS device will then tell you whether or not your component was successfully turned on or off. To simplify, we're going to go ahead and look at a couple PHP files that are on the API. This first one on your top left is first it connects to the database using the endpoint, uh, username, password, and obviously a database name. It also establishes a WebSocket using the IP address of the EC2 instance and a port number. Uh, as you can see on the bottom right here is a simple MySQL query statement that is selecting the component ID, username, and password, which we would go ahead and use for things such as login information. When creating the mobile application, our team focused on three main objectives. First, the ability to control and monitor our units from any network in the world. Second, to provide valid checkback with certainty of correctness. And third, to allow energy consumption at the touch of a button to our smartphones. That led us to the creation of the main view controller. This is the centralized hub for application functionality. As you can see, it is in Spanish because our clients are from Costa Rica. Um, each, each section is divided based on component type. In our case, air conditioning units and lighting units. In the bottom of each section, there is a submit button and an all off button. The submit button attempts to, attempts to turn the real time status of the component, which is indicated by the real time status label on the far right, to the status of the on off toggle switch in the middle. The all off button does exactly as it sounds. It attempts to turn all components in this section to the off state that are currently on. The second thing we focused on was creating an error detection system. The error detection system focuses on things such as the manual switch override, power outages, or internet outages. The fourth thing that it focuses on is whether or not the task was successfully completed or not. As you can see here, we have a problem with connection due to Wi-Fi. Lastly, we wanted to make a graph that was interactive and simple to use. To do that, we created three interactive graphs per unit. Uh, each one of them is a different uh, time increment. So the first one is 24 hours. We made each one of these graphs finger gesture friendly, meaning that with a simple flick of your finger, you can navigate through the graph. For example, as you can see here in the last 24 hours, the increments of the x-axis are on four hour increments. But with a simple swipe of your hands, we can now change it to single hour increments on the x-axis. Along with the 24 hour graph, we also have weekly graphs, and we also have monthly graphs. These are helpful to show trends in your data and for the users to better understand their own data, I mean the energy usage. Upon arriving in Costa Rica, we began our installation with only one unit in order to better understand the environment and to understand the AC units themselves. 
Once we are comfortable with this installation, we move forward with our implementation of six AC units in the Columbus Lounge and two AC units in the offices, as well as four lighting units. During this time, we took on new challenges dealing with low Wi-Fi bandwidth and power outages during the process. Additionally, we, we dealt with secure Wi-Fi networks where we were able to utilize port forwarding for a successful implementation. Finally, we went on to a testing and trial phase before we were able to deliver the application to our partners. As seen in this image, we have in this image we have one of our units installed on one of the office AC units, where there were two bypass or were two switches installed in the process. One bypass switch, which will return power to the AC unit upon any sort of failure, and a pass-through switch that enabled wireless capabilities of the AC. As we continued our implementation, we moved to the outside of the reception area in order to do an installation for their, one of their conference rooms in the overhead lighting. Uh, we went outside in order to have direct access to the breaker box, which is seen here in the image on the right. The image to the left shows an installation where we were in the Solace Columbus Lounge, where the unit was installed, the wireless unit was installed directly inside of the AC unit. However, the bypass and pass-through switches were installed on the exterior of the building in weatherproof enclosures in order to provide a more sleek and clean installation. All right, so next we'll move on to our data analysis. Uh, first we'll talk about the Columbus Lounge, which is here. Uh, we were primarily here, so we had to walk there every day. It's a pretty long walk, kind of hot. So, you know, <laughs> it's kind of fun. Um, here's the top overview of it. So it's units three to eight. This is our units, just so you guys understand in our graphs. And also we have a little picture so you can see the scenery of just what we're looking at. It's an event room, so it's not used on a day-to-day -day basis. It's mostly used on the weekends, so the data uh, kind of fluctuates depending on time of the year, time of the day, time of the month. And yeah, so you can see here's units six through eight, and as well as the rainforest in the background. So, so for the Columbus Lounge here, we have depicted units three, four, five, and eight. The other units had intermittent Wi-Fi issues, which made, the wi which made the data a little irregular, so we didn't want to include that for our presentation here. So here we're starting in August 2017, going up to March 2018, which is our last complete month of our data. Uh, what we like to point out here is that in August, September, and October, Unit 3 was being used primarily over the other units. You don't want this happening because well, you, don't want, you don't want one unit to be running uh, all the time or it failing early, and then you are concerned about the other uh, AC units failing around the same time, since these are all the same model. In February and March, you see that Unit 5 is actually being used a lot more than the other units. This is not because they left it on all night or over a week. Uh, it's actually just because they were using it a lot during that time we've checked, and also because the power on it was actually really high. So again, they're just using primarily one unit, which is not ideal for these types of situations. Next one, we'll go into the analysis of the offices is right here, a bit closer. Uh, basically, what we can uh, boil this down to is comparison between two employees and how they uh, function within their offices, and we're gonna be looking into that a little bit. So I'll walk you through what the graphs we're gonna be seeing here. Uh, so here we have August energy consumption of unit one and two. Thank you. So uh, here we have 9 a.m. going up to 5 p.m. and the same thing for the frequency distribution. Uh, I'll talk about that in a bit. So basically for the total month in 9 a.m. in unit one or employee one used uh, uh, a total of four kilowatt hours for the entire month of 9 a.m. And then that goes for the same for, uh, for employee two which used approximately two kilowatt hours. So for the frequency distribution chart, what we did is basically we kind of can correlate this for when they were in their office. What we do is we go into the database, check whether uh, the unit was on or off. This is done by checking whether it was the energy power rating was above 0.1 kilowatt hours. If it was above 0.1 kilowatt hours, that correlates to one hour. So here you can see that unit two or employee two was in his office for two hours. And for unit one or employee one, he's in his office for four hours. Their schedules vary. Uh, this is because their um, jobs uh, require them to move around uh, the resort a lot, as we saw earlier, and talk to important clients at different locations. So for the next figure, we can see that employee one is in his office a lot more than employee two, and that correlates, again, to the amount of energy that they're using. So you know, if you're using your AC more, you're gonna be using a lot more energy. Uh, what we see here is that at the 5 p.m. hour, they're actually in their offices at this, uh, the same amount of time, so that does correlate to the same, the same amount of total consumption and energy in kilowatt hours. Uh, the, difference, the differences is due to the geometries of the room. The rooms uh, weren't exactly the same and the, the places of the ACs were also different. Uh, for the geometries, one room was actually uh, two times bigger in floor area size. And additionally, the 
placement of the AC was overhead employee two, whereas employees one was across the room. So in February, total energy consumption, we can see that, again, employee one is actually consuming more than employee two. And this is, again, uh, looking at the frequency distribution chart, if you take the integral of the graph, you see that that correlates to how much energy that they're consuming. One interesting point here is that at 10 p.m., the, the two, uh, employee one was in the office 17 hours, whereas employee two was in the office for 15 hours. This does not correlate the same to our uh, energy consumption, where it shows that employee one is actually consuming two times more than employee two. Uh, which we'll move on to our next graph, which, show, which shows uh, interesting, interesting trends that we uh, later, later um, analyzed. So at 12 p.m. or 12 o'clock noon, we see that employee two is actually in his office a, lot, uh, a little bit more than employee one. But for the total energy consumption of March, we see that employee one actually still consumes more than employee two. Uh, this should not be happening, but this makes sense uh, going into the average energy consumption. What we do here in the average is basically for every hour, we take all of the data from that hour of that month and we average it out. What's their power rating for that AC unit? So at 12 p.m., we see that employee one is actually usually consuming at 1.1 kilowatt hours. This means that whenever I go into his office and I were to check at 12 o'clock, his, his his unit will be consuming 1.1 kilowatt hours as opposed to employee two who's consuming at 0.8 kilowatt hours. Uh, this trend is similar for uh, across all hours where employee one is actually consuming at a higher rating than employee two, which goes on to our next part where we took the average of all the data points for the entire year and it actually does come out to, again to be 1.1 kilowatt hours for employee one and 0 0.8 kilowatt hours for employee two. What we did with this information then is went on to do a projection of total energy consumption of the year. The way we did this was basically, so for each employee, this is for one hour of average energy consumption, so 1.1 kilowatt hours. We then multiplied that by eight hours for eight hours in a work day, five days in a week, uh, 52 weeks in a year. And that's how we got the 2,288 kilowatt hours, which is what employee one would be consuming as compared to employee two, which is 1,664 kilowatt hours. So this is energy savings that, or energy savings that you could be saving between the two employees. This means that one employee is consuming a lot more. So what we can do, what is the impact of the difference of 624 kilowatt hours? Uh, we, we're thinking about scaling up from two small rooms to larger, uh, to the whole to rest of the resort. As we saw earlier, we only talked about this portion. They have a lot of rooms, they have a lot of spaces where we can implement our project onto more AC units and not just that, other electrical appliances. To, so we can see greater energy uh, efficiencies and for greater differences. Next, uh, we have a little figure uh, or a little quote from the Energy Information Administration, which is, it says that in 2016, the average annual electricity consumption for all U.S. residents, uh, for all US, U.S. residential customers was 897 kilowatt hours per month with a high of 1,240 kilowatt hours per month in Louisiana and a low of 505 kilowatt hours per month. So 624 hours could potentially uh, power a whole home for an entire month for just one employee. Also, 624 kilowatt hours, uh, bringing it back to oil, is it correlates to 0.37 barrels of oil equivalent. Uh, again, this is only relative for a small project of just you know looking at two rooms. Uh, we can all, we can always scale this up, not just to the resort, but to more things, such as buildings and other companies, other places, uh, U.S. homes, to see greater uh, impacts of our project. So energy improvements, what can we do to uh, mitigate the energy waste? Uh, there's uh, always, we can always do an incentive program where we tell the employees, how can you save more energy? You can look at between two employees. If one employee is actually saving a lot more money for your company, you can actually uh, give, that, give that extra cash back to the employee. Uh, additionally, we can have app notifications where we can show that one employee, hey, you can get, so the app will tell you, hey, you're consuming a lot of energy this month or this year, you should probably, you know, maybe wind down or for a home, you know, to be like, you're above average for a US uh, home resident. Also, the information is also very valuable. Uh, when you look into the app and you look through the data analysis, you can be like, you can, you can see like a line, the averages of everyone. And also you can see when your unit was being on, whether it was on all night, if it was on all night, that's obviously energy waste, especially if you weren't home that night. So with the big picture for our project, we want to move more towards energy sustainability using the Internet of Technology, Internet of Things technology. We want to help Punta Leona become, the, they, they have, we want them to help them reach their eco-tourism goal. And this is, we want them to become more energy efficient and aware of wasted energy, achieve sustainable tourism, 
and save money by reducing energy waste. Next, we have a financial analysis just to kind of bring back uh, what we're talking about. So the energy costs over a year using that projected value we talked about earlier, using their averages of 1.1 kilowatt hours for one employee and 0.8 kilowatt hours for another employee. You see that employee one actually costs a company $222.85 compared to employee two's $162.07. This is at the Harrisonburg electricity rate of 9.74 cents per kilowatt hour. This is a savings of $60 in, in Harrisonburg. Whereas if this was done in Costa Rica, the savings actually jumps up to $120. Uh, using their numbers is 243,000 col 243, compared to 177,000 colonies at the Costa Rica electricity rate of 18.47 cents per kilowatt hour. The reason their electricity ratings are a little higher is because they actually run primarily on renewable energy. Uh, their country is actually known for running uh, close to 100% of their electricity needs from renewable energy sources. So some future improvements that could be made to this project to increase the quality of the overall product would be an interactive map of the facilities at Punta Leona. This would be beneficial if more of our units were scaled up in the, in the resort. Additionally, web app and Android functionality to increase the number of platforms we can install our application on. Uh, necessary Wi-Fi improvements to increase the responsiveness of the overall product. Uh, this could include upgrading to the latest Wi-Fi technologies, or increasing the range of the Wi-Fi signal on site. The range could be increased by additional access points or repeaters. Um, finally, something that could be added to the hardware would be additional sensory technology for various other applications, such as uh, integrated temperature control for adjusting thermostat and various modes for scheduled operation. It is now the moment that we have all been waiting for. Please join me in watching a video of our finalized product in action. <laughs> can we can we scale? Oh, what's going on? I'm Alex Hansen, joining us today with Tyler Harmon and Aaron Vasquez in the Salas Palm Lounge in Punta Leona Hotel and Club in Costa Rica as we show our finalized project, the Switch. Today we'll be testing three AC units in the Salas Columbus Lounge, which is half of the ACs present, and we're going to go ahead and turn them on to show you. As we can see, we're about to switch it, and now we are about to press it. We are now up. One turns on the bottom, two turns on the bottom, and the third one turns on the bottom. Within moments, cold air will be blasting throughout the whole lounge. presentation but before we go ahead and open up uh, the floor for some questions we would like uh, to give a very big round of applause to our partners and sponsors uh, Jose Calderon and Rene Bondo so if you could please help me in thanking them <laughs> during this process uh, we also worked every day with Mauricio Ruiz who is uh, one of the head electricians at Punta Leona. He was a ball to work with. Uh, we had some language barriers, but we got over them. Uh, I would like to go ahead and get one more round of applause for our great advisor team for Dr. Samuel Tawab, Dr. Kareem Altai, and Dr. Shannon Conley. So if you could go ahead and clap. Them. Without them, our project would never have been able to come to light or really to where we're at today. So thank you a lot for that. Lastly, we'd like to go ahead and give an additional acknowledgement to the ISAT 306 Section 2 uh, for helping us do research and development. 
On top of that, we'd like to thank Safa Abantri, who is the Telecommunications Networking Security Lab Manager for helping us in any time we needed equipment in the lab. At this point, we would like to thank you for coming. Hope you have a great rest of your day and open up the floor for any questions. Um, what are your plans for uh, future implementation of this technology? Maybe uh, on campus at AMU or where are you This technology could realistically be implement implemented anywhere. That's what one of the main goals of this project was, to have it universal. Like we were talking about with the hardware, there is a relay that is involved. Just altering this relay or even setting it up to where you have a direct setup with uh, like an outlet, you can really control or monitor any appliance, any electrical device whatsoever. So the, the main goal of this project was to keep it universal, make it to where it's not just you know one unit, one specific use, it's pretty, pretty much any use. Let's go with you and then him. Uh, so is there Android compatibility? Not currently. Uh, we, would, we would like to move there eventually if we continue on with this. Uh, but currently we just did uh, iOS applications because when we initially talked to our partners, uh, they both said they had iPhones. So we, we went ahead and focused our efforts on iPhones. And have you gotten any response about the user interface? About how it Back from the clients yeah, I would say it's pretty nice. I mean, I made it myself, so I'm both biased, but uh, I would say it works well. I have it on my phone. Uh, there is intermittent Wi-Fi issues because the Costa Rican Wi-Fi is not the strongest, but uh, it it works pretty well, I would say. I mean, the, the interface is nice, but once again, I am a little biased on that. <laughs> Go ahead, Brennan. So the Raspberry Pi Zero W, um, why did you choose to use that as opposed to Raspberry Pi 3? And did you sacrifice anything making that choice? Uh, we chose to go with the Raspberry Pi uh, Zero Wireless, which was, it ended up being, uh, it's cheaper, first of all, but it ended up being a hassle to get our hands on them, as many as we needed. Uh, they were brand new right when they came out and they were limiting your purchases online to one per customer. And so we had to <laughs> jump through some hoops to get as many as we needed. but. Realistically, uh, there's a huge price difference, as you know, with the Raspberry Pi 3 and the Raspberry Pi Zero Wireless. The Zero Wireless is only $10, whereas the Raspberry Pi 3 is $40. So it drastically cut down cost, and it still implemented a built-in Wi-Fi adapter. So realistically, it was just a cost. And it, it, it can be scaled down, too. Uh, what we did was a proof of concept and a prototype. So if you wanted to, you could build everything into a really much smaller, compact device. So using the Raspberry Pi Zero wireless could help in that as well. Grant. As a fellow app developer, I've come to recognize the value of human-centered design. Uh, did you take any steps in when you're designing your interface or while you were deploying your interface with uh, communicating with the workers who would actually be using it on a day-to-day -day basis and then make changes back to the app? Sure. Uh, when we originally created the iOS application, it was in English. But because uh, we went down to Costa Rica and we talked to our partners, they, we found out that uh, for a few of them speak English. Jose does speak English, luckily, so, but not everyone does. So we wanted to definitely focus on the client in that aspect. So we, we definitely translated it all to Spanish, not just you know the main part, but every single information page, stuff like that. We also talked to them and they wanted it to be simple and they wanted to have those three graphs like stated. We asked them, we said, what kind of graphs would you like to see when you're looking at your energy? And they come up, they wanted to see a daily graph, a weekly graph, and a monthly graph. So we made that happen. Any other questions? All right, thank, thank you. you for coming.